So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Sonny Gill. That was a great segue. He is a wonderful spine surgeon out of Spartanburg or near Spartanburg. Yeah. Greenville. Greenville. Oh, you have it on your own computer? So my charge is to chat more about scoliosis and trauma. You guys see a little bit of trauma, I'm sure, here. So we'll definitely start there, because that's going to be germane to what you do. Uh, you know, just thinking about the talk we just had, I think the PARS defect, the, the high index of suspicion is really important. And based on your sport, you know, obviously skiing is a very big part of the world here, but you're going to see other people like high jumpers and divers and gymnasts and cheerleaders and football linemen. You know, there's certain people that you really have to be aware of and just keep that in the back of your mind. But I think the one beautiful thing that you showed is that a lot of people don't have access to a stir sagittal image that you showed and that's such a beautiful image because there's no radiation. You don't have to do a bone scan with radiation, which is always scary in kids. Okay, here we go. All right, so Sunday morning, you guys have a lot to do, I'm sure, so let's uh, get going, and I think part of this is getting the lingo, getting the dialect, but then learning the images, because that's really going to be important, because of what you do, you're going to be able to see it, you're going to be able to pull these up on your screens, and I think it's really important to um, be exposed to all these different ideas. If you have questions, please holler at me. I don't mind you interrupting and stopping and saying, hey, I got a quick question. That's a great way to make this more didactic. So every day, right, you've seen that fracture, thoracolumbar spine. So let's come and think about why it happens in that junction. And Dr. Corman already alluded to that a little bit about why um, it works that way. Let's see, it's still thinking, sorry, there we go. So if you look at the spine, right, we think of it as cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, but we really have these specialty segments too, cervical, thoracic, which is a junction, and thoracolumbar, which is a junction, and in and of themselves, they're very different. They react to the body differently because if you look at the thoracic spine, essentially the facet joints are a buttress. So you can't really turn and twist too much in your thoracic spine, right? It's more kind of a flexion, extension, uniplanar motion, and that's because the ribs also add to the resisting of rotation. So you've got this very rigid spine, which is good, because it's meant to protect the lungs. It's meant to protect the vital organs like the liver or the heart. So it does its function. It serves what it's supposed to do. But then we made it to this incredibly mobile lumbar spine, right? And for those of you who do yoga and Pilates and ski, we know we can turn almost 80 to 70, deg 70 to 80 degrees to our center, and that's based on our ability to use these facet joints and these discs that are very tall, right? If you look at the disc height in the thoracic spine versus the lumbar spine, it's very different, right? So part of that adds a shear stress to the disc. What Dr. Corman was talking about, the ADD and the disc degeneration, is that the ability to twist on itself because the facet joints are in a different rotation. I'm sorry, in a different orientation, which allows for rotation. So imagine if you have your thoracic spine that the facet joints are a buttress. Then you take your facet joints, which are paired on the back, and they come in at an angle, sometimes about 45 degrees, so it's a little different. So it can glide a lot more. And not only that, it can flex back and forth. So it's a little different. But then you put those two pieces together, and you have the thoracolumbar junction, and you say, well, that makes no sense. How can you go from super rigid with your ribs to super mobile. And that's the reason why most of our fractures are going to be centered at this junction, T12, L1. Almost every time we hear the fracture, oh, there's a snowboarder that wrecked in the park. It's a T12 burst fracture, right? How many times have you heard that? And maybe sometimes T11, L2. We'll let them get in on the, uh, the play also. So you go from this kyphotic also to lordotic, and you have essentially that straight spine. So we call it a stress rise. Remember that T10 to L2 junction that Dr. Corman was showing the anatomy, and that was straight except in Schurman's where we saw it was very curved, which is abnormal. So we have to remember that not only do we go from this kyphotic spine, which he did a nice job telling us the angles, to the lordotic lumbar spine, we have this straight area. And imagine if, you were to, if I were to jump off of this, right, with my knees straight, 
and not bend my knees at all. Not a good idea, right? I'm not going to do it. So <laughs> I don't need any of your partner's help, Dr. Corman. And then, but imagine then if you were to flex, right? So that's the difference in the stress. So boom, right there. You go from this transition to a very straight area and think about that same analogy. Jump off the platform with your knees and ankles locked and you focus all that stress to that junction and you create this moment and it dissipates all right there at T10 to L2. So that's why our fractures go right there. So it makes sense now. So now we say, okay, so not only do we have these four parts of the spine, but we have these junctions. And you know, also the lumbosacral junction is a specialized junction. So when we hear about these fractures, we say, all right, well, how old were they? And the reason why that's important is because there's different bone stock, right? Are they osteopenic? Are they a young, healthy, 17-year-old skier who was in the park? It's a very different mechanism. Or were they ejected from a car? You know, are they on I-70 and uh, they were in the snow and ice and they got ejected from their Jeep or truck? And those things happen. So it's a very different energy because if you're just standing and you sit on a toilet or sneeze and you're osteopenic because you're 80 years old and you're in your vacation home in Beaver Creek, you can fracture your back. Or you're laughing at a dinner party. You can fracture your back, right? Remember that postmenopausal female, so all those risk factors, smoking, postmenopausal, Caucasian, female, all those things can make you very osteopenic. So you don't have to have a major trauma to break your back. And once again, the same rules apply. It goes to the junction, that transition force. So we have to know how much energy did that spine incur so we know how much we have to treat it from a stability standpoint. And you want to think about what are the surrounding areas. Obviously, higher energy are going to have some higher risk. Do they hit their head? Are there sensory changes? Did they maybe lose their bowel and, bowel, bowel and bladder function on the course or on the, on the ski hill? So those things you have to think about. And then obviously secondary issues like rib fractures, floating ribs. So we, we worry about all those things, but then if it's a lower energy, you want to know whether or not, hey, have you broken your hip before? Have you had a DEXA scan? You know, are you a minus 2.5 type of person? Are you on a bone, anti-bone resorptive medication? So all those things can help you, and we'll see why. So it, these are nice little charts. I used to carry one of these when I was initially starting out because it would help me figure out what their sensory level was. You ever heard of the Asia grading? So the Asia grading is how we talk about an Asia A to E, A being the worst, E being um, intact. So A is someone who's a quadriplegic or paraplegic. So when you're trying to communicate to your providers, like a rehab hospital or the OR, you're trying to grade what's their sensory level, right? Nipple line, umbilicus, legs, neck, hands. And they have very specific dermatomes and myotomes also and we can even look at it and say, all right, well, our reflexes, you know, we don't have to memorize these by any means, but, you know, we can tap the reflex and say, all right, we're absent at C7, so we know something's amiss, or we're absent at L3 so, or L2, so we know something's amiss there. So we just they go through the different parameters of what is your neurologic exam. So that's really important because the neurology is going to dictate how we treat these, too. 10% of patients have other spinal injuries. It's worth reiterating that. 10%. That's a lot, right? One in 10. You can miss that. Whether that's another spinal fracture, do they have a neck fracture? Do they have a distracting injury like an ankle fracture? Do they have a liver lac laceration? That can certainly happen too. So you got to look out for those. Because remember, they may be in so much pain and fear because of their spine fracture that they don't even realize that they have a splenic fracture and they may be bleeding out from that. So 10%. Don't forget that. So why do we even classify it? Because, you know, all right, they, they broke their back, you know, so let's get, get the show on the road. The most important thing is, I, you know, really you want to think about this in three different criteria. What's the stability? What's the pain meaning deformity, too? Because pain usually underlies a deformity, kyphosis or um, some other translational deformity. And what's the neurology? What's their, what are the neurologic elements doing? Are they intact? Have the, has anyone done a rectal exam? Has anybody checked their EHL, something subtle that we may miss? So those are really important things to tell us what is the fracture doing to the body. All right, so we classify these very simply. I think the most common one's the three column, right? If you look at a spine, 
you've got the vertebral body in the front, the canal kind of in the middle, and the facet joints and the posterior elements like the spinous processes in the back. So those are all very nice, helpful ways to classify it. The reason why we think about this as a three column versus two is that middle column predicates a lot of what we do. Why? What's right behind the middle column? Correct. So either cord or conus or coda equina, right? So all those neural elements are right behind, right here in that posterior element. I'm sorry, in, in between that middle and the posterior element. So we say to ourselves, all right, so this does help us to think about it. Do we have any middle column involvement? And we can then go and further subclassify this. It's not worth remembering all these things. These are just a matter of saying, all right, we know that we can start thinking about this. Is this something very simple where it's just in the front? like a one column injury, like a compression fracture, you know, which is usually the norm with our osteoporotics. Or is this something horrific, like a fracture dislocation where it looks like two parts of the spine on two different x-rays? And of course, that PARS defect that Dr. Corman just talked about, that can be even traumatic too. So let's go with some basic ones first, because I think that's a good warm up. You know, the transverse process, you can think about it as a direct blow. Did they fall on it? and they fall in their ski pole and oh, they hit their transverse process, it's incredibly painful. If anybody's ever pulled an intercostal muscle, broken a rib, had a muscle spasm, remember the transverse processes are where the muscles insert. So you break that and all of a sudden the muscles spasm and they look like they're an extremist, they look horrible. There is one little exception, that's the L5 spinous process all the way down below. And the reason being, is that the sacrum and the lumbar spine, remember the junction, lumbosacral junction, those are important, right? They have a nice little ligament, the iliolumbar ligament. It stabilizes the spine on the pelvis. It's one of the stabilizing ligaments, not the only one. So when we see L5, we pause. As we say to ourselves, is there a bigger energy moment that we're missing? Is there more trauma that we don't know? But for the most part, we're gonna get upright x-rays, we're gonna treat them in a brace, maybe even a soft brace and say, all right, don't do anything crazy for a little while and then we're gonna do some rehab and some massage and get them back to where they wanna be. This is a version of what you just learned, that PARS defect. I, I find these amazingly interesting. I see a lot of these. I, I see quite a few a week, uh, even in adolescence or elderly. When I say elderly, I mean uh, the adult population. So they change as they go through life, right? When they're younger, they may be a non-listhesis x-ray and then they go to a grade one and maybe a two and they get a disc collapse and they get foraminal collapse and they do get neurologic symptoms. So these are interesting um, fractures because it has a long-term history that's sometimes not the greatest. The, remember the x-ray you asked? I forgot who asked, can you see it on x-ray? That x-ray was really hard to see. This one's a nice one and this is from Dr. Corman. You can see those PARS defects right on the on the lateral there, right? Remember the PARS is that connection between the front and back of the spine. That's, just think about it that way. It's this mysterious word we use, the PARS. It took me forever to figure out where it was in the spine. But if you just think, all right, so the front's really the part of the pedicle, the vertebral body, the back's the spinous process, the facet, and we gotta connect those two. And it's a very solid connection. It's hard cortical bone, right? Dr. Corman, we learned that the PARS defects don't heal very well, but the pedicle fractures heal better. That's because it's more cor cortex bone in the parts. So you can see that nicely. Um, you don't need obliques all the time. You, you can sometimes just use a lateral or even an AP. You know, the Scotty dog, that's the age old thing that we say, all right, it's the collar. Ever, anybody ever heard the collar of the Scotty dog? So remember, if you really trace this out, you can really see it. Here's the ear. Here's the snout and the mouth. Here's the front leg, the body, the back leg, the tail, and here's the body, and then the collar. Isn't that crazy? Whoever thought that up really um, may have been on some additional medications, <laughs> but there it is. I mean, I look at that now and I say, that, that's pretty clear. So that's helpful to look at. And you know, th that's an oblique x-ray. And sometimes I'll get those two for completeness, especially in a younger adult, and that may, but you know, don't be fooled. Because the problem is, is sometimes overlying gas, air, bowel, um, air gas shadows can make it look like it is, but it's not. So just make sure you look at it in different planes. All right, so we've heard a little about the parts. So now let's go to the columns, right? The anterior, middle, posterior columns. So we're gonna work our way upwards. Simple fracture, 
not a lot of kyphosis. And the reason why I say that, because when you have more kyphosis and more compression, think about the energy, right? The more you collapse that spine, the more that energy has to dissipate through all three columns, inter, middle, posterior. So you have a terrible collapse or a terrible amount of kyphosis, you know that those posterior elements are going to be also weakened too. So we want to start thinking about numbers. They're not hard and fast, but these are just some numbers that we have in the back of our head that says, you know, if it's a lower energy injury, we're probably going to say it's not a burst fracture, didn't go in the canal, we can treat these in a brace with upright x-rays. But we've got to watch them, right? Because we can always be fooled and they can always progress. This one's the more common one that you're going to see, the flexion distraction. So more of the body's going to be collapsed, all right? So not only does it crush down, and it's like a, you can think of someone who compresses when they're landing in a hollow and a jump, and they compress down and they widen their sp posterior spinal elements. And there's rules where we say to ourselves, when do we need surgery? And we don't have to go into that realm just yet, but sometimes if they change from a supine x-ray to an upright x-ray, which is very important, or what their neurological status is, those are things that we start saying, maybe we need to do something more significant, like stabilize these with pedicle screws, or however we do it. So those are the two, and you know, you can see it can look like a compression fracture. That's why I always pause to myself when I say, uh, is this just a simple compression or does this have more energy? And you can see in the thoracolumbar spine, so we just work our way up, let's assume that it's 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 12, 11. So you can really see how collapsed that is and how kyphotic it is, and that's probably in the range of the 30, 40 range, so that you know that there's some posterior ligamentous injury. And the best way to do it on a clinical exam is Put your hand on them, tap on them, tap on those spinous processes and see whether they say, yeah, that really hurts back there. They'll tell you. You know, you don't necessarily need an MRI to show you, but you can also look at the, you can see how the spinous, and we'll see these a little later, so don't uh, panic just yet. We're going to get a better view of this later, but the spinous processes don't have a synchronous flow as you go down on that AP. You, you watch your march down it and you say, wow, that's a big difference. So we'll look at that a little later when we see a flexion distraction, probably one of the most important things is if we suspect it and you get an MRI, remember that stir image or that T2? So you're gonna see a lot of water or edema in the posterior elements. Those are the ligaments that stabilize the spine. Remember the interspinous and the supraspinous ligament that you guys have learned about? Those are the things that get a little micro tear. So that's part of the dis uh, disruption of the posterior ligamentous complex. You can even see this intraoperatively. If you look at the spinous processes, Right, each one, boom, 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 and then boom. And you see a nice big tear in the ligament. You can see that intra-op when you're going in there to stabilize it. So it's very interesting to say to ourselves, wow, this is a true difference from just a simple compression. So that's why I always cringe when I say, just when I hear, it's just a compression fracture. The onus is on us to prove it is, because I always go with the fact that it's probably a flexion distraction and maybe not just a compression, unless it's an osteoporotic. Then I say, all right, maybe it's more of a compression. Remember the energy. Right, very different for someone who falls onto a toilet seat versus someone who gets ejected from their skis and ends up in a tree well. All right, so very different. Chance, fracture, fra chance fractures are just a little variation. So if you think about it, use your two hands like a sandwich. If you take the moment of inertia and put that moment in between your two hands and it collapses down like that, that's that flexion compression. But if you take a chance fracture and let's say the moment is at my watch, so it's anteriorly, it's like opening a door. You unhinge it. So that's the difference, all right? It's almost like here's the hinge. The hinge is at that anterior longitudinal ligament, and we just open the spine. Those aren't as awful as they seem, actually, because these widen the canal, believe it or not. They can create tension on the neural elements. So that can be bad. But if it's bony, those will heal. Remember, it's beautiful cancellous bone. The vertebral bodies have this meshwork of blood and osteoblasts and all these amazing cytokines that help it heal. But if it's ligamentous, it may not heal, meaning if it just purely cuts through the ligaments, the, the disc, the facet capsules, the supraspinous, interspinous ligament, then you might have trouble. It's much like a full ACL tear or a full MCL tear. That's not going to heal on its own right, versus a 
simple fracture that's going to heal with nice cancellous bone. So that's the one we have to stabilize. But remember this guy again, the flexion distraction? So the difference is, remember, the moment of inertia is anterior to the way it gets uh, unhinged in the chance fracture versus this. It crushes down and widens. So just be, make sure you don't confuse the two. That's an easy one to confuse. All right, let's go to, the, this is the workhorse, the burst fracture. We hear this a lot. And burst fractures come in amazing variations. They can fill the canal with awful amounts of bone. They can have very minimal little crunch back. Some of the worst burst fractures, you look at it on CT and you say, how is this person neurologically intact? And I'll even you know, examine them again and I'll say, wow, this person really is. You know, I guess sometimes just better be lucky than good. So you have to think about it as an anterior and middle column involvement. It pushes back into the canal. And the reason we start saying, all right, what's the neurology here? Because it pushes back into the canal. That's where the neural elements are. So we have to do a very thorough assessment of the neurologic elements, including a rectal exam. I can't tell you how many ER docs we'll talk to and say, oh, I, I just deferred that. Well, you can't defer that. That's where the conus ends. That's where the neural elements lie for that part of the spine. You have to check the hip flexors, even though it hurts. You gotta check their EHL. So all those, all those things are really important because that predicates how we treat this. The age-old thinking is, all right, if you have a lot of canal compromise, you've you got to go in there and do something. Maybe not, because it really has evolved with time. If you get this awful burst fracture, just like that, and you follow these over one or two years, there's a law called Wolf's Law. And if there's no pressure on that bone in the canal, which there isn't, because remember, the canal is a unloaded element, right? It's where the neural elements lie. It'll start resorbing itself. And I have these beautiful images that I've seen one and two and three years post-op where it actually just resorbs through a little bump. It's still always a little bit there, but you can't reliably depend on that if they do have a neurologic compromise. So we base these a lot on stability. Remember we talked about stability, pain and deformity, and neurology. So that's how we were going to decide on who and what we treat non-operatively or operatively. So those are two very different categories that we're going to place these two in. If they're intact, they're stable and upright, we can put them in a brace. Like a compression fracture, no problem. But, um, and most of these will heal fine. You know, patients all say, will this expand to where it was? No, it won't expand. This is you. As long as the arc of the lumbar lordosis or the thoracic kyphosis of the junction is what we're supposed to be, then we're happy with that because we always want to look at the long alignment. And I think this is a really nice CT because it kind of shows you that whole long alignment. You can see how that thoracolumbar junction is straighter. The thoracic kyphosis is a little bit less right there because they're in a CT scanner. So with time, that hopefully comes back. So then we think about unstable ones. So this is where you get that split of the vertebral body and the pedicles expand apart. And initially you might say, well, that's okay. You know, that expands the canal, that's good, but that's a lot of energy. So the problem is, is that we know that that also, if you look at other cuts, that has a big burst component that goes back in the canal. And if we put these people upright, they collapse, they collapse forward. And you can see how a lot of these are laterally translated or they have an inherent we don't want to use the word scoliosis, but maybe translation where they tilt one way or the other. So remember that pain and deformity scale? So now we're starting to realize, all right, not only do they have neurologic issues, but they have an associated deformity, not only in the coronal plane, but also the sagittal plane, right? They fall forwards and sideways. So that's a big problem. And we'll see that more when we do upright x-rays. And I think for me, these are where it really comes into fruition of, can I even treat this in a brace? And those are the ones that you say, all right, in the garden variety burst fracture, we treat so many of these, I know we're okay, but always get that upright x-ray because I really think you can be surprised. This is the horror story, right? This is the one that is not a happy situation. These are the ones that are you know, ejected from a motorcycle, ejected from their skis and found down on a cliff. You know, these guys are in trouble. So obviously that goes without saying, that's gonna need some type of stabilization. Believe it or not, these are not hard to put back together because they're so grossly unstable. There's nothing holding them back together. And you just have to put two clamps, put them together. But it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, but this is what we deal with, right? 
So let's go with two special types, pathologic fractures. You have the beautiful Shaw Cancer Center and you know, a lot of it gets referred in from referring area from the Western Slope. And metastases, meaning spot, uh, mets that are from other organ systems like prostate, lung, liver, all those things go to the spine, right? Because of that amazing vascular complex. Some people call it Bat Batson's complex, that valvulus section of veins that goes up and down. That's the theory is that's why the tumor cells go to it. And it's a lot of blood supply to the spine too in the vertebral body. So they go to these preferential places and you get what looks to be a simple insufficiency fracture. And then you have a bone scan that shows that they're riddled with mets. And the treatment criteria for that really varies. You know, how long are they gonna live? Can they stand a surgery? If they're a lung cancer patient, they may not be able to. And other things like if they are gonna live for maybe a year, can we do something from all from the back and relieve their pressure from their core because they may be getting paraparetic? Yes, please. Oh, it's such a great segue. Why don't we go into that in just a minute? Keep that thought, I'll get there. Um, so a high index of suspicion. Once again, this is one of the fractures I say to myself when I see a simple compression fracture with no trauma is it an insufficiency fracture? Believe it or not, when we do kyphoplasties and we harvest the bone through the bone biopsy needle and we send it away, studies have shown that eight to 12% of those come back myelodysplasia, meaning lymphoma or some other myeloproliferative disease like multiple myeloma. That's a shocker. You know, you're going in there for just a simple kyphoplasty and all of a sudden you have to come talk to them a week later about the fact that they have a new diagnosis of multiple myeloma. Remember, multiple myeloma, unfortunately, don't, they don't light up on bone scans. So it's a fuller. And it, it's a treatable disease, but it needs to be treated. So that segues into insufficiency. So, um, you know, when I was here before, we didn't see a lot of the osteoporotics. I think it's probably getting a little more, maybe, with a lot of the second, third, fourth homeowners, however many homes they own. Um, and, you know, you get that person who's hanging out and they're having their cocktail party and they're laughing uh, ferociously and they break their back. You know, those things happen. It's crazy. Or they sneeze. They cough, right? And they get that fracture. And they look terrible. But you remember the energy, right? So it may be so brittle, like a cornflake is the diagnosis that I tell people. Think of the difference between a marble and a cornflake. And a marble is pretty hard to crush or a gobstopper. You really got to go after it, right? versus a cornflake, you know, you just look at it, it's gonna to come to pieces. So, it, you know, it's good to have a DEXA scan, it's good to know their history, they might say, yeah, doc, I fell three years ago, broke my wrist, you know, that's always the humdinger, or yeah, doc, I had a hip fracture, you know, I was down walking around. So all those things make sense, and remember your, you know, postmenopausal uh, females, those people are really at high risk for osteoporosis. So you can see this, you know, the classic dowager's hump. That's a horrible situation to be in. This is going to be a more advanced reconstruction because remember the load, the abnormal load. As they fall into kyphosis, I give the analogy. If you've ever been to a riverbank and you see a tree starting to fall over and you look at the roots starting to pull up on one side, once it starts to go, it's just going to go, right? It takes time, of course, but it just keeps going. So same with these horribly kyphotic, horribly fractured spines. And usually it's a series of them. This is actually not Schurman's. This is someone who probably gets a T12 fracture, then they get a T10 and a 9. So they just go on and on. It's really a horrific situation to be in because they have such pain and deformity. Um, I, I promise we'll get to kyphoplasty in just two seconds. So the stir image, lovely, a lovely image because once again it, hi it highlights it, right? It tells us this is where it is, right? That's the edema, the water. It's wonderful. I mean, it's almost like God's gift to spine surgeons because we're not very smart, so it gives us the ability to say, hey, that's where the fracture is. Versus this one, it's a different level. It's L1, but there's no edema. That's chronic. And, those, and people say, well, you know, when will that change? I know I, I fell two years ago. And yeah, somewhere in the six months to a year to two years, that changes from a highlighter, from that stir image, to normal marrow because it goes through this cycle and it goes through a healing process. So that's what I will say, yeah, it's probably about right. Two years ago you fell, it doesn't light up. I can get that, I understand. Um, 
So then we go back to the simple stuff. All right, so we talked about all the different kinds of fractures, and, and we'll talk about treatment, which will include kyphoplasty. And we say, how do you look at it? How do you even, how do you even understand? And it, it, to me, it's much the same. Remember that cervical spine assessment where you look at the lines, you say, all right, I've got an anterior longitudinal line, posterior longitudinal line, spinal lateral line, and the posterior spinous line. It's a similar idea. You're looking at the arc. You're looking at the natural process of whether or not you have intact column height, and you want to look at your, also, the fact that, can you look at the back of the body, which sometimes is very nice to be able to see, and can you see anything pushed back? Sometimes you can really see that well on a good x-ray or a burst fracture, you get a hint of it. And on the AP, obviously, you're looking for rotation of the spine or some type of spinous process splaying. So remember the spinous processes that we looked at, the other one? So you can see the spinous processes, remember the, the eagle eyes and the nose, and you see the that uh, spinous process, you say, wow, that was atypical, because you went from there to a big jump down below, and then the next one is, hmm, that makes sense. So you say, well, that's an abnormal amount of um, uh, distraction on the spinous processes, and so that gives you a little tip off to think to yourself, all right, even on x-ray, without an advanced image, we're starting to get a little suspicious. So I, I think it's worth taking some time to really trace it out and say, can I look at the ribs? Can I look at the transverse process? I always look at the L1, L2 transverse processes also because I want to know whether or not this was an additional injury if they tumbled and whatnot. And then the pedicle splaying. Remember we talked about how those really bad burst fractures, you get this explosion of the vertebral body and it just it goes from an intact body to split apart. The reason why it does that is it's math. Remember that formula pi r squared h for volume of a cylinder? If you decrease H, the radius goes up. So it splays apart. So it's an incredible thing that, you know, all these laws still apply when we think about the spine and the anatomy. And we couldn't have made a better spine. It was just unreal how much structure and support it gives us. So you can see this, the abnormal distance of the pedicles. And that makes sense when we're looking at that CT scan and say, all right, got it. So the vertebral body split, it transferred its energy and pushed it apart, pi r squared H, all right? So then we look at it from other situations. Remember that burst fracture, the reasons why we worry about it? The neurological elements. So we look at it, and when the lateral, we can see it, hopefully. And the problem with these really unstable ones is not only do they have instability on the x-ray, but they also have some neurologic issues. The reason being is we have these, so that looks like a burst fracture. We'll check that. That's good. And then it's got that sagittal split, yep, so it's looking unstable, but then it has this amazing little additional thing, and that's the sagittal split of that lamina. And the reason why that's so important is that when we get an MRI, look at how the neurological elements get trapped right in that sagittal, sagittal split. It's incredible. It happens every time. You think to yourself, oh, it's just a little break in the lamina. It'll be fine. And then you go in there and take it off, and lo and behold, the next thing you're looking at, 7-Up and spaghetti, which is what I call a self-irrigating wound, which is dural tears and CSF. So it's really, it's disheartening when you don't expect it, but when you expect it, you know. And you have to say to yourself, yeah, there's something going to be really bad lurking in there. So that's why we look for these very specifically, and that tells us once again, pain and deformity, yep, we've got that, neurologic elements, yep, we are looking at that also. And also, we're looking at stability. So that's why we say to ourselves, those are the ones that push us over the edge and make us want to operate on them. Um, greatest thing to do, obviously, is measure angles. And, the, and you know, we won't go over this uh, to beat it over your head, but you know, intact end plates, right? Just find your nearest intact end plate. It's not a hard science. Say, gosh, you know, like this one's actually a really good one to say, I don't know where to put my line. So you're probably going to go here and here, right? So those are the two you're going to look at, and that gives you a kyphosis. And then you think in your head, all right, 40 to 60, you know, 50 degrees lumbar. So you're looking at your normals, right? And then you look at your vertebral body height, and you say to yourself, all right, that's abnormal. The anterior vertebral height is much different. And remember, that's a significant loss. So we're thinking to ourselves, that's maybe not just a compression fracture. That might be a flexion distraction uh, fracture. So it's a little bit more significant. And these do heal. It's a very characteristic way, like we talked about in MRI. You know, there's these very nice cutting cones, which are called osteoclasts, and the osteoblasts come down, and they 
lay their beautiful collagen matrix and then it gets calcified with phosphates also and other minerals. And it heals at a very predictable slow rate. So we know that sometime in the two and a half to three month range, we're gonna be able to say, yeah, you're healed predictably, that you're gonna do okay. And there's many, many different braces and there's many, many ways to do it. The simple compressions were going to be a lighter brace, something very nice like that, or a cash brace. But the bigger ones are going to do a TLSO or something more structurally sound. Um, there's even a movement to say, do we have to brace these? But I think the problem is, is that you miss one and it could be bad. So the brace, you know, uh, off the shelf TLSO, obviously for our prosthetics and orthotics uh, folks, they have that on the shelf. They're able to trim it, fit it, make sure they do okay. Um, some people you need a custom TLSO, you know, the very severe burst where they're still stable and upright, believe it or not, or if they have a little bit of an angular shift where you can treat them in a brace. Body habitus, you know, I know in Vail everybody looks like this, but you know, parts of my world, they look more like that. So we have to say, all right, need a different brace. Um, so we'll custom fit those. Uh, stable burst fractures, you know, they'll heal, but once again, they're going to have some residual. And you can see this is a very nice image how you track that posterior line of that body and say, wait a minute, that's not a perfect arc, right? That splays backwards a little bit. So that tells me that was a burst fracture. That'll get better with time, but that still tells me that was a significant injury. Kyphos and vertebroplasty, boy, this has come full circle. It's amazing. And part of doing a talk is educating yourself. And I, I came to this slide and I said to myself, whew, how do I tell them what to do when there's so much controversy? And I, I think it's, it's come to a point where we say, all right, maybe we have a better idea of when to use it. Vertebroplasty plus minus. Maybe we'll put that on the side table and say, let's not talk about that, because maybe that may be a more archaic uh, way of doing it. And a kyphoplasty, so we'll call it a cement introduction to the vertebral body. There was a beautiful article in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010, 11, when it came out and they randomized people, and they had crossover, and they said there was absolutely no difference. If you delve in it to a little further, they didn't make a distinction between acute fractures and chronic fractures, which I just can't, it blows my mind, which I didn't realize at the time when I read it, but as the editorials came in over the years, because so much research was hinged on that, is that they treated chronic compression fractures with kyphoplasty. Those aren't gonna get better. Right? It's almost like saying, well, you know, I'm going to treat something a way that shouldn't be done. So it, it made sense. So then now we have some other data, and they have all these cute little acronyms about um, kyphoplasty and whatnot. It's like ATKIS and this and that. But if you, if you dig through it, there is good evidence that shows kyphoplasties of people who have stability, meaning they don't fall into kyphosis, but have acute pain that fail bracing can help them. So I think there's a utility. So four weeks is what they were saying, is the fail bracing at four weeks where they're still acutely painful, neurologically normal. So we go through our three criteria again. Stability, pain and deformity. The reason why I put pain and deformity together is usually the deformity that causes the pain. So pain and deformity and neurology. So neurologically tacked, so put that aside. Stability, they're stable because they're not falling into kyphosis, but they're still super painful. So at four weeks, it's been shown to be a valuable option to offer people. Yeah, so the degree then goes back to stability, right? So if they have a significant collapse, like 20 degrees, you may not want to do that. That may be overarching the requirements. Percentage collapse of 50% usually, yeah. But you know, having said that, uh, you can get almost a vertebra plana, right? And the way some of these collapse, right? The thoracal uh, lumbar junction is straight. So maybe they just collapse straight down. Remember that example of jumping off the platform with your knees locked? So if they collapse like a pancake, remember, there's not a lot of mass in that bone. It's, it's, I mean, if you look at an osteoporosis model, it's amazing how the architecture really changes. So that's maybe not as hard and fast, too. Neurology, stability, pain and deformity. Um, it's just not uh, the way, <laughs> uh, 
the way the U.S. goes is that we have these companies that house the balloons and the treatment plans, and they don't sell vertebroplasty very much anymore. It's hard to find. You can do it. You need a biopsy needle, mix up some cement, and push it in there. It's a bit like putting a plaster cast on. We use fiberglass now, right? It's very hard to find plaster anymore. So that's why we're more of the realm to say, all right, well, there's 15 balloon augmented kyphoplasty companies. You just have to pick the one you want. It, you know, it was called kyphoplasty because of kyphon, right? They, they term that. But now we try to use the term balloon augmented you know, vertebral uh, stabilization. You know, it's too long to <laughs> so say kyphoplasty, right? It's a bit like saying Kleenex or Xerox. There's other people, right, that make Kleenex. Can I chime in a little bit? Please, yeah. So the difference between a kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, you introduce a balloon through the pedicle, widen the whole vertebra out, and create a core area where you smash bone and soft tissue away so you create a chamber, so to speak. And you can introduce cement, and it'll hopefully stay in that chamber. With vertebroplasty, you don't put the balloon in just inject cement, if you get a fracture line that comes back through the body, you can have cement come back into the canal or out into the soft tissues and it's disastrous. So in general, vertebroplasty isn't used because of those problems. And kyphoplasty at least gives you more safety. It makes a chamber for the bone cement. Are you able to do um, imaging during the surgery? You do, but by the time you see that dye swimming out of the wrong place, It's a great point. You, you can even get these little veins, the base of vertebral veins that go into the back of the body and it can leak out the back. So all those reasons why. Yeah, please. Do you, do you change your bracing protocol so that in four weeks it's still symptomatic they have the kyphoplasty? No brace after the kypha. Yep, let them go. And they're pretty happy with that too. You know, I think there's a quotient of people that talk to their buddies and say, if you go in there and tell me it hurts, you can get out of that brace, get a kyphoplasty. You know, it's, so it's, yeah, you know, I, I get it. It's yeah. not, it's not uncommon, though, that four-week mark is really that tipping point, though, for the fractures, lower fractures, minor fractures, and you really start feeling better after four weeks. Remember that a cutting cone and the osteoblast? There's an initial sticky stability that happens with that protein that gets laid down. It's, a, it's an interesting thing because there's been so much data one way or the other. It's just becoming maybe a little bit more clear as we edge, future, edge into the future. No, they're much less now. Much less and probably much more appropriate, I think. No, they're still trending way down. Yeah, still trending way down, which I think is appropriate because I think at certain points in our career, kyphoplasty was almost like a knee injection. It just, you know, if you had even a suspicion of a back fracture, you were getting kyphoplasty at three levels. You know, and I, I just, you still have to remember, if you look at that solid piece of cement, that's a hard marble and buttery bone. It never gets a chance to heal with its own bone. So I like for it to heal with its own bone if you can. That's what I tell people. I said, give it a chance. Your bone's gonna be better than the cement we're gonna put in there. This, to this day, we don't have true cement that reforms into bone. Can it be more than four weeks in? Can it be six sure, weeks? of course. Yeah, three months even. Yep. Yeah, so the six months is what the studies are saying is where it goes from subacute to more chronic. Yeah, I would hope that you would uh, make your decision before that time point. You know. Yeah, uh, and that, but I think for me, at least, I like to see these heal with bone. I'm not a fan of chiropractic. It has its place, but if I fracture my back, I want my bone to heal in. I don't want, this is a marvel to creating a stress riser. So what's going to happen with the bone? Yeah, I feel the same with that. But you have to have in your treatment armamentarium. It's always important, right? So we give them the option, and we instruct them and say, you know, it's not real bone, so you're always wary of it, leery of it. Adjacent, what they call adjacent segment fractures. 
So a great talk. You know, that can go on forever and ever. Kyphoplasty is just a very hotly debatable topic still 10, 12 years later, which is fun. And it goes to show you there's many ways to skin the cat. Um, and then surely, you know, the time to healing, like you said, you know, four weeks seems to be a good point. And then eight to 12 weeks, we're moving on. Starting, I like water therapy. I like keeping core strength strong. Isometrics, isotonics are wonderful. I'm a huge proponent of physical therapy. Obviously, having been out here a couple of times, it's just one of those things where protocols for fractures and what to do. And swimming is amazing to build the core strength. You know, I'm a believer in it. I uh, try to do it five, six times a, a, a week if I can, because I just think, you know, our core is really where everything else attaches to. Um, but late surgery is still an issue. You have to follow these people. It's not just three months, all right, kick them out the door. Good luck to you, sir. You may want to re x ray these in a little bit and make sure that they haven't had a late collapse. And that can happen. Remember, pain and deformity, stability. So, all those things can make a difference. Because an unrecognized ligamentous injury, even with MRI, where the ligaments get slightly attenuated, can continue to collapse. Remember that tree in the edge of the riverbank, that moment arm still there. Yeah. Can you talk about uh, not putting on the person sitting? Yeah, so theoretically, the therapists are great at showing people how to roll into their brace before they get into. Yeah, they have These are theories and they're realities. Right? I have an 86 year old father who just had a lumbar laminectomy two weeks ago. And, you know, it's, you make amends, right? Yeah, you make amends. And you're right. Young, healthy, 16-year-old, go get them, no problem. Yeah, but the thought process is these are theoretically stable enough that there's a section of people who don't even brace them. So that gives us some comfort for bracers. I think you're a bracer too for the most part, right? Yeah, I'm a bracer. You know, I fall more into the brace camp um, because I, I just like the added stability and the added security. and. Uh, but it makes me feel more comfortable knowing there's a quotient of people who just, bah, go do what you want to do, which you have to be careful of because those can burn you. So it gives me more sense to say, it's okay. If it's really hard, I get it. Put the brace nearby. And they said, Doc, what about getting up in the middle of the night to go use the bathroom? Yeah. I get it. You know, it, you're not going to tell an 80-year-old or a 70-year-old <laughs> all that. It doesn't happen. My dad fell, actually, post-op. You know, it's frightening, and it's just one of those things. You just are like, oh, my gosh, you know, because the bad things happen. So these are my quick words. Sorry I didn't come yesterday. My, this little one, this is UVA, is nine. So she's all of glitter and glam. This one is all of can I huck myself faster off the skateboard and get another bruise. I have two opposite kids, so I couldn't miss the party. So thank you for allowing me to be late. Um, water break and then go to the next one. Sounds good.